Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of History in a Nutshell. This presentation is presented by Liz Lee from the Charlotte County Libraries and History Division and this month's topic is Henry Flagler, Trains and Florida Tourism. Born to Isaac and Elizabeth Flagler on January 2nd, 1830 in Hopewell, New York. At age 14, he left to join his brother at Chapman, Harkness and Company, a business in Republic, Ohio. This is where he first got into learning about business and he became really, really good at it. He took over as the general store manager in 1845. He moved up the ranks, got married and he moved, long story short black gold. Flagler and Rockefeller were friends and entered into the oil business together. He oversaw arranging the freight rate negotiations for crude oil and refined oil with the railroad systems at the time. And here are the four of them. The Atlantic and Great Western, Lakeshore and Michigan Southern, the Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia and Erie. These were all northern-based railroads. And it was the battle of the refiners to get the best rebate, so he pitted them against one another. Next was the topic of expansion, combining or merging with weaker refineries. And this started the idea for the formation of the Standard Oil Company. He retired from the Standard Oil Company in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as it started to decline and dissolve. His first wife, Mary Harkness Flagler, died in 1881, and he wanted to spend more time with his children, hence the retirement. He remarried in 1883 to Ida Alice Shords and decided to honeymoon in Florida. And you might think of the Florida of today, oh, it'd be a beautiful place to honeymoon. There's tons of restaurants and hotels and beaches to visit. Well, Florida looked quite different in the late 1800s. So to honeymoon in Florida, they were in New York at the time, and they wanted to go down to Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, maybe that would take a couple hours on an airplane for us today. Their trip took 90 hours because of the many changes and delays of different gauges of railroad tracks. And when, when they got from New York to Savannah, Georgia, there were two travel options to get further south to Florida. They could take the steamboat or they could take a train. And in the book that I read, whichever one you chose, you wished you had taken the other. There wasn't a direct route and it was by far not a comfortable journey. And their trip ended in St. Augustine, Florida for their honeymoon. St. Augustine, Florida at the time. So it was a word to you to describe St. Augustine was dumpy. It was run down, but Flagler had an idea to develop more of it for winter weary travelers by building hotels and a new train depot. Again, transportation was limited in 1880, train, trains primarily. And St. Augustine was surrounded by all these little railroads, but Flagler believed that St. Augustine would be a resort center for Florida. So he started buying property and revitalizing the city. He built the Ponce de Leon Hotel, which is featured to the right, and a few others. And Henry Flagler never really set out to build railroads, but while building the Ponce de Leon Hotel, he realized that the train system in St. Augustine definitely needed renovation. He tore up old railroad, he replaced everything, and the transportation of materials for his building projects and just general goods in Florida, they shipped much faster. So tourists began using the new route as well, so more and more people were starting to trickle down into Florida. He purchased more railroads, he built bridges to connect them all the way up to Jacksonville, and he even developed citrus farms. So he was very good at his investments. The completion of the Jacksonville Bridge meant through trains could be operated between New York and St. Augustine. Trains and tourism. With the new and improved railroads, train depots, and luxury railroad cars, more tourists traveled to Florida, especially during the winter months. We have our modern day where lots of people from up north, where it's really, really cold in the winter, come down where it's warmer in Florida. Same idea. The train system in Florida stretched from Jacksonville to Daytona in 1889. 
and it made connections with steamers, boats on the river, on the Halifax River, which was into the rich citrus belt. He purchased a hotel in Ormond, right outside of Daytona. He enlarged the building, he made the grounds prettier, he added a golf course. Now, he wasn't into golf, but uh, he thought it would be a good attraction as it's a very popular sport. And Daytona is known for what? Automobile racing. Automobile racing fans frequented the hotel too, and the hotel soon became famous. So Flagler is on the up and up with hotel restoration and building. Here's another important part. Making Miami. A lady named Julia Tuttle tried to convince Flagler to buy some of her land off of the Miami River. Even after many no's from Flagler, she kept at it, saying it would be worth his while. Then, Florida experienced one of the coldest periods in the winter of 1894 and 1895. But the Miami River area was untouched by the horrible freeze. So all of their crops, all of their citrus trees were still living. They were still bearing fruit. They were beautiful. And this was one of the reasons Flagler visited Mrs. Tuttle and decided to expand the railroad from West Palm Beach to the Miami River. Railroads built Florida communities. Wherever the railroad was headed, territory was developed and towns were established. And this is how Miami came to be. Miami was incorporated as an official city on July 28, 1896. Flagler built the Royal Palm Hotel in Miami, the railroad, an electric light plant. He started a system of sewage and water and built churches. So he's the one that f gave you know Miami the first boost up into what it is today. The railroad was completed on April 15, 1896. And after the railroad, Miami just blossomed and it boomed. By the 1900s, wood burners on the trains were changed to coal burners to be more resource and cost efficient. They were using a special sort of pine tree, but as more and more of the train tracks were built and the use of the train increased, less wood was available, and so it got to be a very costly expense, so they changed over to coal. Palm Beach or Bust Flagler was full steam ahead to Palm Beach, Florida. It was a small town at the time, but he saw, again, great potential for all of the undeveloped land. He built and built and built both railroads and the Royal Poinciana Hotel, which is no longer standing. The hotel was for people of wealth, fashion, and high society. He built the Breakers, another luxury hotel, which burned down in 1903, but was rebuilt by 1906. It is a beautiful hotel, and I've actually been there. It's absolutely gorgeous, and if I remember correctly, why the breakers burned down in the first time, in the first part, was someone left in a curling iron. Also, the hotel was mainly made of wood, and fire and wood is not a good combination. But again, this giant, beautiful hotel was rebuilt in 1906, and you can see it today. Stuff happens, long story short. <laughs> on August 13th, 1901, Henry Flagler divorced his second wife, Ida Alice, due to her being certifiably insane. And I mean insane. If you would like more information, I would recommend the book that I read, which I will be mentioning at the end of this presentation. So, divorced his second wife, and seven days later announced his engagement to Mary Lily Keenan. At the time, Henry Flagler was 71 years old, and Mary Keenan was 34. They were married on August 24th, 1901, and it wasn't of, oh, hey, hi, how's it going? Let's get married. He and Ida Alice, again, his second wife, they had known Mary Lily um, from their time spent in St. Augustine and subsequent years. They would go on different excursions together. She was a family friend, and true love happens. All right. Now, this is really, really cool. The building pictured here is Whitehall. Mary's wedding present was Whitehall in Palm Beach, now known as the Flagler Museum. It is a wonderful and awesome building to tour. If you get a chance, I would highly recommend it. And this giant building, and just in the upstairs, there were 16 plus rooms, if that tells you anything. It's a massive building. It was built in a record eight months. Wow, right? 
it's, it was the height of the Gilded Age fashion. If you've ever seen the Biltmore Estate up in North Carolina, that's kind of what it was, similar style. The inside is old world inspired from Italy and France. On the second floor, there are 16 guest rooms with each one representing a different era in history. For entertaining purposes, Flagler built a magnificent ballroom for Mary, and they still host balls and events in the ballroom today. Flagler's last project, The Train to Key West. The book that I read about Flagler called this Flagler's Folly. Everyone thought it would be impossible, but in 1905, construction started, and it took a total of seven years to build. Due to sickness, available and willing workers, the healthy supply of drinking water, swampy earth, and the challenge of building in water. Equipment had to be floated to build much of the railroad, costly concrete bridges that you can see in this photograph here, and they were called viaducts. Uh, based off of the aqueducts that you would see in Rome for water distribution. During the construction of the Overseas Railroad, there were several hurricanes which caused further delays. Also, they'd knock the cranes into the water, and the cranes were highly expensive. It was finished on January 1st, 1912, 24 hours before Henry Flagler's 82nd birthday. Making Tracks the first official train to cross the Overseas Extension arrived at Key West on January 22, 1912. Flagler was on board along with some United States government representatives and international delegates. Flagler's Overseas Extension was called the Eighth Wonder of the World by the Miami Herald. Flagler's Folly Flagler died in 1913 before he realized his dream wouldn't come true. Key West didn't grow into the metropolis Flagler had envisioned. It didn't become the American Gibraltar. Very little freight came out of Cuba and, and South American countries. On Labor Day in 1935, an unusually strong hurricane hit the Florida Keys. Miles of embankment were washed away. Train track was destroyed, but the large bridges survived. The Florida East Coast Railway, one of Flagler's corporations, couldn't fix the damaged areas, but the State Road Department built a highway where the railroad had been in 1938, once again connecting the Keys to the mainland. Flagler's legacy. He developed a large part of East Coast Florida, mainly Miami, Palm Beach, and Key West. He increased tourism to Florida by improving railways having more goods, um, they were able to be imported and exported from Florida faster. And he put Florida on the map, bringing it to the attention to the rest of the United States. I mean, everyone knew that there was a state called Florida, but he really put it on the map, and so more and more people started coming down to see us. These are my resources and references. The book that I read was Henry Flagler, Visionary of the Gilded Age by Sidney Walter Martin. We have it in our library system under B for Biography, Flagler. And here are some other books about Henry Flagler from, that you can check out from your local library branch. There is Last Train to Paradise, Henry Flagler and the Spectacular Rise and Fall of the Railroad that Crossed an Ocean by Les Standiford. Uh, there's Henry Flagler, Builder of Florida by Sandra Sammons, and Whitehall, the Henry Morrison Flagler Museum, Palm Beach. And I believe that one has all the information that you could ever want about the Museum Whitehall. Thank you guys for watching this History in a Nutshell presentation, and we will see you next time. Have a good day.